The liturgy is the life of worship for over two billion Christians around the world. The modern liturgy has gone through many transformations through the past 2,000 years. There are formal, almost rigid ceremonies. And there are ceremonies that are fluid to the point of being almost non-existent. Whether one is from a high church, like the Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox traditions, or a lower Protestant form, like most Baptist assemblies, all convocations ultimately have the same sources in history. In the Middle Ages, there was only one Christian religious tradition in Western Europe, the Roman Catholic Church. There have been many changes within the liturgy of the Church, many of which remain even today, that were started during the papacy of Gregory the Great from 590 to 604 AD. With the liturgy formalized at that time, it was possible to begin expanding on the beauty and the teaching impact of those services. reform on the order of the liturgy. He added some dramatic elements, like the Kyries, and changed the order of the liturgy to make more sense. By reducing the role of deacons in the service, he freed them to perform other duties, like perform in plays <clears throat> or sing. One of the greatest changes Gregory made was with music. He introduced what you now call the Gregorian chant. Of course, we didn't call it that yet, but we will soon. Gregory has to die before we can na start naming parts of the liturgy after him. The chant introduced a stable, reproductible form of music that could form the background to many different activities, including a play, which may or may not be getting added to the liturgy in the near future. Okay, Ephraim. From the top. We like to sing Gregory. Around the same time as Gregory's reforms in the Roman Church, there were some significant changes taking place in the Orthodox Church of Eastern Europe. There was an expansion of the homily into an almost sort of play in the 5th and 6th centuries. Preachers began to act out parts in biblical narratives, taking on different roles and acting out the drama for their audiences rather than just reading them from the texts. The birth of the liturgical drama was almost upon Christianity. The greatest changes were made by a hymnographer named Romanos in the 7th century. He wrote several contakia, or extended canticles, that centered around things like the Nativity, the crucifixion of Jesus, and Abraham's attempted sacrifice of Isaac. Complete in these contakia were dramatic characters, a chorus, a narrator, calls and responses to and from the audience. These canticles were, in effect, the first liturgical dramas. However, the full-blown liturgical drama will not really appear until the Quem Quiritis in the West. This is because, so far as we have evidence, there were never really any gestures by the actors. There's no character of movements, and there's no scenic action. These things will have to wait for their Roman counterparts to introduce them into the liturgy later. The Byzantines, at least at this point, preferred to keep things rigid and structured. Seven centuries? Now get serious! 
Canticles or songs of the Byzantine Church from the 7th century could have been hits on an ancient Broadway stage. However, the Eastern Church wasn't ready for that kind of theatrical production just yet. Drama had to work its way in slowly, especially where the sacred was involved. The Western Church seems to have been more accepting of accoutrements and new ideas concerning the liturgy, although they were added slowly over time, too. With new changes in music, however, the stage was set for the addition of scenery and characters that actually moved. Hey guys, I'm in a pun! Ha ha ha! It's not until the 900s that Quem Quiritis, possibly the first real play to take place inside of the Western Church, was produced. Such was the distaste for drama in the West that it took centuries for theater to enter back into the mainstream of Western culture, that is, the Church. Why such a distaste? Well, apparently because pagan Rome had loved it so much. Certainly, there were plays that were distasteful and immoral, but that doesn't mean that the whole of theater was bad. To the young church, newly coming to power, anything that smacked of the old ways, of paganism, of immorality, needed to be cut out. Except, of course, as the church grew, the immorality and excesses that were enjoyable to those in power, because those were okay. And those were let in much sooner than the theater which would be a public spectacle, and we have to keep up appearances. Nevertheless, Quem Quiritis is a play about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The three Marys approach the tomb and are greeted by an angel who asks them the question, Whom do you seek? Quem Quiritis, from which the play draws its name. Their response is, Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. Famously, the angel responds, Why do you seek the living with the dead? He is not here. He is risen. As Christianity began to spread throughout Europe, the Roman Catholic Church was faced with a problem. While the Mass was held only in Latin, a shrinking number of people actually spoke that language. Britons, Franks, various Germanic tribes had little to no exposure to Latin outside of military conquest or the Church. The liturgy to these Masses was unintelligible and the church needed a way to connect these new believers into the body of Christ. They needed something that could be understood by everyone. This is the gap that the liturgical drama began to fill for the Roman church, and the teaching aspect of theater remains with us even to this day. The human instinct to play act reasserted itself. The stories of Christmas and Easter were acted out. This happened first in England, in Winchester, where lie the bones of the old Anglo-Saxon kings Canute and Ethelred. In the year 965, the bishop instructed his monks, let four brothers costume themselves. One shall be in an elb and go secretly to the place of the sepulchre. There let him sit quietly. Let the other three, dressed in copes and holding thoribles, go forth toward the sepulchre as if they were seeking something. This is done to represent the angels sitting at the tomb and the women coming with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. Quem quiritis in sepulchro? Whom are you seeking in the sepulchre? Non est hic, he is not here, he is risen, as was predicted. 
Go and tell the people that Christ is risen. The medieval liturgy began to embrace a broad spectrum of practices beginning in the 9th century through the 12th century. It was during this time period that the church became both the foremost concert hall and the principal theater of the Middle Ages. Indeed, the church was seen by many as the opera house of Western Europe. This time period saw the introduction of the mansion stage. The mansion stage had a large open area called a platea with houses or locations situated in various places to indicate different locations. These stages started inside church sanctuaries and usually had one or two locations at most, often heaven and hell. The actors would move between these locations as necessary, but almost all of the action was taking place out on the platea in the middle of the audience. These new liturgical dramas would gain in popularity, except in the Orthodox Church, which for some reason apparently hated moving characters. By the 1300s, with increasing complexity and depth, the liturgical dramas had become widespread and demand for them was insatiable. In an attempt to gain converts and interest in the church and its activities, in the 14th century England, the liturgical dramas were moved outside of the church sanctuaries. This was the advent of the pageant wagon, with the mansions being placed on portable stages made of various cars and moved from place to place. This had the desired effect of drawing people to the church, but it also opened the door for secularization, and modern theater probably can trace its roots back to these pageant theaters. Five centuries. We gotta get people to go to our church with the play. Oh uh, yeah, that's what we meant. Uh, would it be all right if we got rich and famous too? Let's start building wagons. I'll work on new scripts. Can't you hear me? Well, it seems like they're going on the road. The popularity of the liturgical drama began to outgrow the festival seasons of the church. There were 80 holidays in countries like England, and in the 14th century, the average peasant only worked about 150 days a year. There weren't enough holy days to fill all that free time with liturgical drama, so the people started to look for other forms of entertainment. The 14th century was also the highest wages in the medieval period, so people had money to spend. The movement, to the, the movement of the liturgical drama from the sanctuary to the street provided an outlet for people craving entertainment. It provided a much needed inlet into the church by bringing the gospel to the streets, and, of course, only as much as lower and secondary concern, it brought a pretty penny to the performers. Actors who performed well and playwrights with talent were beginning to become celebrities. The liturgical dramas of the Middle Ages have several lasting effects even into the modern era. They were the precursors to the area and to the recitative, music that is sung to sound like speech. Modern musicals, most especially operas, owe their genesis to the liturgical drama of the Middle Ages. It's hard to tell what would have happened if the liturgical drama didn't develop just the way that it did. But certainly, without the backing of the most important social institution of the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church, it's quite possible that theater as we know it would be very different or still in a much earlier stage of development. While many of the plays would have been considered boring or mild compared to modern standards, these aren't modern plays. 
and they were wildly entertaining to people whose only other alternative was to watch crops grow. There was also the added benefit for parents that their children were being taught about their faith while being entertained, something parents have worried about throughout history. Additionally, the effects of the liturgical drama are still present and felt in the popularity of things like religious movies, plays, or music. There are still liturgical dramas that are performed every year around the, the seasons of Easter and Christmas. Every 10 years, the famous Passion Play of Oberammergau is performed from May to October. This is the longest running play in history, having been performed over the past 376 years consistently. Other religious events, very similar to these ancient liturgical dramas, happen across the globe year round. Who knows? There's probably one sometime, someplace soon, in a church near you.